everyone, it's Tarrant. And Stella from the Dice Tower. Thanks for joining us. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Rhone Invasion, a game designed by Stefan Stefanik and published by Bonjour Games. We are using a prototype copy here of the game, and so the rules and components may not be final. Let's get to it! Rhone Invasion is a deck building and dice crafting game which in its base form plays one or two players. Players will train new cards to make their most powerful decks, spend resources to make their most powerful dice, and defend their own health while attacking their enemy. There are two modes of play, competitive and cooperative. In the competitive mode, two players will face off against each other, trying to reduce the opponent's health to zero. In the cooperative or solo mode, the players will fight against the invading Synex, attempting to defend their own health and win the game. In this video, we'll take you through the competitive mode of the game first, and then talk about how to play the cooperative and solo mode. Competitive play uses three of the game's five decks, the playing cards, technologies and leaders. Invasion and protocol cards can go back to the box. Within the playing cards, separate them into starter and non-starter cards. Starters have no screw cost in the bottom right corner. Each player assembles a deck with one copy each of these 11 starter cards, then shuffles this and places it face down on the deck section of their player board. Keep remaining starter playing cards face up and shuffle the non-starter playing cards face down. Shuffle the technologies and deal three to each player face down. Each player chooses one of the seven leader cards that they wish to play as and puts it face up into their base. Then looks at their technologies, chooses one to keep and returns the other two to the deck, which is shuffled back in face down with all the rejects. Give each player four dice, and these are fully craftable by inserting these screw pieces into the holes. Each die should have one fully blank side, and each other side showing one different coloured screw. Players now fill their training centres with cards from the main playing card deck, and these are cards that players will be trying to add to their personal decks during the game. Each player will draw the top three cards of the playing card deck, Look at them and choose one to add to the training centre, setting the other two aside. Do this four times. Then shuffle all players' rejected cards back into the deck. Each player takes a starting armour of 16 and a starting health of 14. Choose a first player. The second player can take spare parts actions up to a total cost of two spare parts, and we'll talk about what these are later in the video. You're now ready to play. Rhone Invasion is both a deck building and a dice crafting game. Each turn you'll be drawing cards from your deck and rolling your dice, using the resources you've rolled as part of the cost of playing the cards you drew. As with many deck builders, cards will move from your deck to your hand and then you'll play them to your played area. From there, cards may leave play to one of two places, either to your discard pile or your garbage dump. Both of these serve largely like a deck building discard pile, however as cards go to your dump instead of your discard pile, you're going to get punished each time you shuffle your deck. You have a personal market of new playing cards in your training center, and through the game you'll be spending screws to add those to your deck, building it up. Cards up here aren't available for use until they've entered your circulating deck. On the left of your board is an area called your base, and these are cards which are not part of your deck, but they can give you ongoing active and passive abilities as long as they're face up and you'll be allowed to add more cards to your base as the game goes on. And as you proceed, you'll be able to make your dice more powerful by removing blank screws from the sides with a screwdriver and inserting coloured ones. You'll use all of these different areas to build up your greatest strength, all in the attempt of reducing your opponent's health to zero. The game comes with six different colours of screws, and these are used for several non-interchangeable functions during the game. 
which is to say that there are screws in dice, there can be screws on cards, in the stored resources section of your board, or used as markers on tracks. All of these uses for screws serve different functions in the game. Be careful not to mix them up and not to interchange one with the other. Understanding that, let's have a look at how to play the game. Rhone Invasion is played in turns, starting from the first player and going back and forward until there is a winner. Each turn is broken into eight phases. First, beginning of turn, where any effects that specifically resolve at the beginning of turn trigger. Second, draw, where you'll draw cards into your hand from your deck. Third is roll, where you'll roll your dice. And fourth is main, where you'll take main actions, including using your dice for resources, spending those resources to play cards, and resolving the effects on those cards. Fifth is store resources, where you'll gain resources for any cards or dice that you didn't use, and send disused cards to your garbage dump. Sixth is spare parts, where you'll take spare parts actions based on any spare parts on cards that you've played this round. Seventh is Train, where you may have the opportunity to move cards from your training centre to your discard pile. And eighth is the End of Turn, where effects that resolve at the end of turn are resolved. So now let's go through each step in detail. The first phase is Beginning of Turn, and the only thing you'll do here is if you have a passive card face up in your base with an effect that says, at the beginning of your turn, then you'll resolve that effect now. Second is draw, and you can draw cards from your deck one at a time and looking at them between draws until you have as many cards in your hand as you wish. There is no limit. But as we'll see, there can be both advantages and disadvantages to drawing more cards than you need. The third step after you've finished drawing is to roll your dice. Simply take all of your dice and roll them once. Now it's time for the main phase, and here you'll use these dice and these cards, as well as some other things that you've gained, to take actions. There are five different actions. Use a die to collect resources. Transform dice into a resource. Play a card. Activate an ability on a card. Or take a stored resource action. You can take any number of actions and as many times as you can afford, with the exception that you can only take each card's activated ability once per turn. The first three actions, collecting resources, transforming dice to resources, and playing cards, are all somewhat intertwined. When you collect resources from a die, you spend that die and gain the resources shown on top of it into your resource pool. There is no physical representation of your resource pool. It's simply a resource that you know you have available to spend at this time. If, for example, I used all four of these dice to collect resources, then I would know that I had a green, a red, and two black resources to spend. If you've previously upgraded your dice, you may end up with even more resources in your pool. You may also transform two dice and that is two whole dice, not just two resources on dice, into one other resource. So, for example, this player could use these two dice to collect and transform these into a green, giving a resource pool of two reds, a blue, and a green. Once you have resources in your pool, you can use them to play cards from your hand to your played card area. The cost is shown in the top left corner, so this card would cost one red resource, and this one would cost a yellow and a red. As such, the resources collected by playing these two dice is enough to pay for both of these cards. If a card has a wild icon as part of its cost, then any resource can be paid for that. So the resources collected from this die would be enough to pay for this demolisher card. In this way, you can see the benefit of drawing more cards from your deck in the draw phase. Because you don't yet know what you're going to roll, you've got a better chance of getting cards which match with the resources you roll the more you draw. The fourth type of action is to use an activated ability, and this is the text ability above the line in the box of any card you've played this round, or next to an arrow icon in any refreshed card in your base. 
When you use a played cards effect, simply resolve it. You can only use it once per turn, but don't discard the card yet, as you'll need it for the spare parts phase. When you use the activated effect from a card in your base, resolve the effect and then exhaust the card by rotating it 90 degrees. You won't be able to use that effect again until the card has been refreshed back to its upright state. Usually by your leader's passive effect, but also by some other effects. If your card has both a passive and activated ability, the passive ability still works while the card is exhausted. So now let's look at some key actions. The black fist represents melee, and when you deal melee, the opponent loses armor equal to the attack. Once you've run out of armor, excess melee is lost from your health. The target icon is range damage, and with range damage you always lose that amount from your health, even if you have armor. A card which destroys armor targets the opponent's armor, and one which says lose armor targets your own, but in both cases excess damage does not carry over to health. Similarly, lose health means lose your own health. Cards may also let you gain armor or gain health. The loser is ultimately the first player who runs out of health, irrespective of the amount of armor they have left. A card might grant you a re-roll, in which case take a re-roll token. These carry over from round to round, and at any point you may spend one to re-roll a die which you have not already used to collect or transform to resources. Some effects will force you or your opponent to either discard cards or put cards into your garbage dump. Other effects will allow you to recycle a card, which lets you take the top card either from your discard pile or garbage dump and put it back on top of your deck. If an effect lets you recycle more than one card at once, then pick up all the cards first, order them however you like, and then put them on your deck. Aside from influencing which cards you get to play, these actions also determine how quickly you cycle through your deck, because each time you reshuffle your deck, you'll suffer a penalty, which we'll talk about later. There are some other actions you'll encounter, but for now I'll move on and start talking about the next phases, because that's where those actions become important. First, we'll talk about stored resources, which is this section of your board. You can take stored resources actions as part of phase four, the main phase. But for the most part, you'll be storing the resources during phase five, the store resources phase. So let's talk about that now. When you reach this point, any resources that you've collected or transformed on your dice, which you haven't spent on cards, you can now store. This player has spent the two red and yellow, meaning that there's a yellow, a black, and a green for storage. Take those coloured screws from the supply and then put them on their matching coloured spaces. Next, if you have any cards remaining in your hand that you drew but did not play, you store resources equal to their costs. So here, two blue and a black. Again, take them from the supply and put them into the resource storage area. But then put all those unplayed cards into your garbage dump. Once again, you can see some of the benefits and disadvantages of drawing too many cards. There are also some card actions that will let you store a resource as an action in the main phase. And when you do this, take a screw of your choice from the supply and store it in the same way. If you run out of space to store a certain type of resource, then you can always store it in one of the wild slots. And if storing a wild resource, then it must be put in one of your wild slots. It doesn't matter what color of screw you choose for this. If you go to store a resource and you have nowhere to put it, then simply destroy the resource. Stored resources are used for taking stored resources actions in phase four, the main phase. You must have both slots in one row filled in order to take that stored resources action. To take the action, destroy the two screws in that row, and then you get one of that resource to put towards the cost of the next card you play, and you take that stored resources text action. You can use any type of stored resource to contribute to the wild cost of a card. 
but if using your wild row from your stored resources, that may only contribute to a wild cost. That is to say that this card could be paid for with this die and either of those rows of stored, but this card could only be paid by this row. A stored resource action means spending the resources, doing this effect, and then getting the discount on your next card play for the purposes of the sequence of your actions. So we've spoken about stored resources actions from phase four and storing resources in phase five. Now we'll talk about phase six, the spare parts phase and some of the actions relevant to that. Through your turn, you can gather spare parts and it's mostly what's printed below the line in this box of the cards you've played. You can also get spare parts from tokens. For example, if this card had been played during phase four, one of its effects is to gain the rewards of another card played this turn. The rewards are the spare parts below the line. So here, this card would gain two spare parts, which you'd take in tokens. A technology token can also be spent as a spare part. The difference between these tokens is that spare parts tokens are lost at the end of the round if not used, while technology tokens carry over from round to round. So right now this player has five total spare parts, which must be either used this round or lost, and a sixth one which can be carried over. These are now spent on spare parts actions in any order and in any combination. I'll cover these actions from bottom to top. For six spare parts, you can discover a new technology. Draw the top three cards from the technology deck, look at them, and then choose one to add into your base, destroying the other two by removing them from the game. This levels up your passive or ongoing abilities. You're not allowed to take this action if you already have two more cards than your opponent in your base area. For four spare parts, you can gain a new starting card. Recall that the leftover starting cards were placed face up next to the main playing card deck. You can choose any one of these and then put it on top of your discard pile. For three spare parts, you can upgrade one of your dice and you'll do this during your end of turn phase. Simply take any screw out of one of your dice and replace it with any other screw from the supply. The last two spare parts actions are really more relevant to phase seven, the training phase. So let's just quickly resolve how to finish phase six, the spare parts phase. It's at this point that you'll move any cards you've played this turn to your discard pile and discard any spare parts tokens that you've yet to use. The train cards phase is all about moving cards that you fully trained from your training center to your discard pile. There are two main actions which you can encounter in either the main phase or the spare parts phase which contribute to your training. First is recruit. When you recruit a card, you draw the top three playing cards from the playing card deck and choose the one that you think you'll want to try to train. You recruit that into your training center and you're gonna have a maximum of six cards in the training center at one time. The other is an action which says gain a screw, and that's a screw icon in a black hexagon. Don't confuse it with the melee icon, this is an icon of its own. When an action tells you to gain a screw, take a screw of any color from the supply and then place it onto a card in your training center. If you have no card here, you simply lose the screw. Once you reach the train card phase, any card which has as many screws or more than its training cost is now trained and you destroy those screws, returning them to the supply and then place the card onto your discard pile. Screws on cards which aren't fully trained remain there for subsequent rounds. Finally, it's the end of turn phase and any effects you've gained this round that trigger at the end of turn are done now. Play then passes to your opponent. When you go to draw a card from your draw deck and it's empty, whether this be during the draw phase or through some other action effect, you now resolve the sequence of steps outlined here. This is where the cards in your garbage dump are going to come back to haunt you. Count the number of cards in your base and then up to a maximum of that many cards, move cards from your garbage dump to your discard pile 
and lose one armor per card. Then count all the cards remaining in your garbage dump and lose one health per card. Next, your opponent benefits, gaining one technology token and any other triggered effects. In particular, for all players' leaders, this includes refreshing all cards in their base. Finally, reinforce your deck, which means to shuffle your garbage dump and discard pile back together and flip it over to become your new draw deck. Then continue with the draw action you were taking. The game continues until one player has run out of health, whether or not they still have armor. That player loses and the other player is victorious. The rulebook also has rules for advanced competitive play in which you'll play best two out of three or more and carry over much of your built up deck and dice to the subsequent games. In the solo and cooperative game, players will fight together against the invasion of Celesta and the Sinex ship, which is represented by this board. This version comes with a three scenario campaign, each with its own win conditions and options for varying the difficulty. This mode uses the invasion and protocol cards, which are the AI's equivalent of the playing and technology cards. To set up, place the round counter at zero. Separate the invasion cards into starter and non-starter cards, the starters having the gold border around the cost. Shuffle the starters and deal out five cards plus four per player in the game. These cards become the invader's deck. Remaining starters and all non-starters are shuffled together to become the invasion supply. Shuffle and draw one protocol, putting the rest of those in the supply as well. Then deal out an invasion card face up into each of the five training slots. Then do player setup as before, the only differences being that players do not get the defending squad starter card and second player does not get any free spare parts actions. You're now ready to play. The cooperative mode is played in rounds. First, the invasion will take a turn. Then all of the players will take turns simultaneously. And then there's cleanup. The invasion's turn resolves in seven phases. First is beginning of turn, and this resolves the same way as the player's beginning of turn. Second, advance the round tracker. Third is the deploy invasions card phase, and you'll count up the number of players and protocols and then deploy one card from the deck for each. If this were a two player game, you'd deploy three cards. One at a time, play the card into this area and resolve any when deployed effect printed here. For example, this would be recycling a card. When you deploy a card on top of an existing card, overlap it so that all you can see of the lower card is below the bottom line. Continue until you've drawn appropriate cards. At any point, a card is considered to have statistics equal to all of the effects and icons you can see below the top card's deploy text. So this card's statistics are two melee, two armor, and two health. Once you've defeated this card, this card's statistics are one range, one melee, two armor, and one health. While most cards only have these icons, some cards also have special effects written in text. These stats don't come into effect right now, but they will when players attack or are attacked by the invasion. Fourth is the train invasion cards phase. If at any point the invasion has an effect which allows it to store a certain type of resource, then you'll take the matching colored screw and put it into its matching colored training zone. Then in this phase, any card or cards with stored resources equal or greater than the cost of the card must be trained. In the order of the player's choice, destroy resources equal to its cost, add the card to the invasion's discard pile unless otherwise stated, and resolve the effect revealed under the card. Fifth is Protocols Refresh. The invasion will gain technology tokens during the game, and if it has equal or more than the number of players, then destroy as many as there are players and refresh all protocols. Sixth is Use Protocols. 
Any refresh protocols are now immediately used. And finally is the end of turn phase where any end of turn effects resolve. Once the invasion is done, the players will take their turns, and each phase of the player's turns, except for the main phase, is done simultaneously. The main phases are also done at the same time, but the actions are taken one after another, in whatever order the players wish. For example, this player might resolve this action in full, then the other player could resolve one of their cards, then this player again, and so on. One of the primary aims is to attack and defeat the enemy's deployed cards. And these are resolved in the familiar way. Melee will reduce armor, then health, and ranged will reduce health. Between these two effects, it's enough to defeat the top card. Normally, players will simply combine their abilities to defeat an enemy all at once, but if you do need to keep track of their armor and health, you can use screws for that. If your attack icons exceed the total defense of the top card, then any excess damage can still be applied to the next card. When any player plays a card to gain health, armor, or recycle a card, then that benefit can be gained either by that player or by one of the teammates of that player's choice. And when a player spends a re-roll token, it can be used to re-roll one of the other player's dice. All other abilities, such as gaining screws or spare parts actions, are for only the player who had those parts. Finally, during the main phase, melee, range, armor, or health icons that you gain can instead be spent on these additional player actions on the invasion board. Once the players are done, you'll move to the cleanup phase. First, you'll fill empty slots in the training zones from the supply deck. Then, any deployed cards that the players fail to defeat will fight back. First, you'll resolve the top card, and you'll attack with the card, which is something which can be triggered in other ways. This means that all players first suffer ranged damage, equal to that card's range value, and then suffer melee, equal to that card's melee. So here, one ranged, then two melee. Then, store any resources shown in the top right corner of the card, and then discard it to the top of the discard pile. Continue doing this till you've resolved all cards. So here it would be three melee and a blue stored resource, and here two melee and a yellow and blue. You'll now proceed to the next invasion phase. In addition to this sequence, each scenario comes with events, which are described here and have a duration shown here. For example, in the easy mode here, after three rounds, you would do more invaders, and the invaders would get one free card from the supply deck. After a subsequent three rounds, the invaders would get to research a new protocol, and then again after five. Bad things will happen more often and more quickly as you go to the harder modes. You should track the timing of the forthcoming events by placing a screw on the time track. When the invasion is forced to draw from an empty deck, you'll go through a slightly different sequence for that deck. Put garbage dump cards equal to the number of players on top of the discard pile, then count the remaining garbage dump cards, and destroy one stored resource of your choice for each. Each player gains a technology token, and then increase or decrease the length of the current event by one, depending on your choice then reinforce its deck in the usual way. If the players meet the scenario's win condition, then they can move on to the next scenario, retaining everything in their decks and bases that they've gained so far. If any single player runs out of health, the players lose the scenario. And that's how to play Rhone Invasion. Check out the project page of Rhone Invasion. We'll put the link in the description below so you can check it out. If you find this video useful, please help us by hitting that like button and subscribe to the Dice Tower if you haven't already done so. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please leave that in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. See you next time.